So if you've ever built a car audio system or you've had your hands on car audio equipment, you've likely heard the term crossover. What exactly is a crossover? We hear all these different terms, active crossovers, passive crossovers, high pass, low pass, band pass, what does it all mean? More importantly, how do we pick a crossover frequency and slope? How will using the proper crossover settings help protect our speakers along with making our systems sound better? That's all coming up. Hey guys, Mark here. Welcome to Car Audio Fabrication, the show where together we learn how to master car audio and how to design, build, and install our dream car audio systems. So like I said in the intro, many of the different components that we use in car audio have crossover settings. Amplifiers do, digital signal processors do, even head units and component speakers will have a crossover. It's really critical we understand what a crossover is for and how we can use it to our best advantage. So let's start with what is a crossover? A crossover basically limits the frequency response of the signal that's sent to a speaker. Let's really break this down. So a subwoofer's objective is obviously to play the base range frequencies. So usually from around 20 Hertz up to anywhere from 80 to 100 Hertz. For the sake of an example, let's just say 80 Hertz in this case. So if we feed a full range signal to a subwoofer, in other words, frequencies that are above 80 Hertz, we're actually gonna hear that sound coming from the subwoofer. Now the problem with this is when speakers start to play frequencies that are higher than their intended range, they start to do what's called beaming. Now, if you guys have been watching my videos for a while, you'll know that I actually had a video about this. It's called on-axis versus off-axis response, but I'll give you a quick breakdown. Beaming is basically a phenomena where once you start getting higher frequencies than what the speaker is meant to handle, the sound starts coming away in a directional pattern. In other words, if I was aiming this speaker at you and I was playing a high frequency, it's gonna sound much different pointed directly at you than over here. And there's a problem with that when you mount speakers in doors and things like that. So one of the first reasons to use a crossover is to limit frequencies that are higher than what the speaker or subwoofer is intended to play. So the second main purpose of a crossover is to also protect speakers. For example, here I have a tweeter. Now in case you don't know, tweeters are responsible for playing the high frequencies. If I were to feed a signal to this tweeter that played frequencies that are lower than its intended range, it would actually take very, very little power to blow this tweeter. Using a crossover which limits the frequency ranges, I can make sure that only the high frequencies are sent to this tweeter. So basically using crossovers allows us to first control beaming from not occurring, secondly to protect speakers, and third, if you look at it in an overall sense, it's so that we can have each speaker in our system performing a dedicated task. In other words, subwoofers play the lows, our mid-bass slash mid-range play the mids and mid-bass, obviously, and then the tweeters play all the high frequencies. With allowing each speaker to perform its dedicated task, it can then excel at performing that job. So up until now, I've been using some pretty generic terminology. Let's dive in and take a look at three different categories of these crossovers. So the first crossover type is called a high-pass crossover. Basically what that means is if we have a frequency, let's just say 100 in this case, everything above 100, it's going to allow to pass that crossover. So as an example, this is something that you would see on like a mid-bass speaker. We want the subwoofer to play 100 and down, so on the mid-bass speaker, we're gonna high pass at 100 in this example, and that means that the information above 100 is gonna be sent to that mid-bass speaker. Now the next crossover type is called a low-pass crossover. Low-pass in this case is kind of what I described in the previous example. This would be on, for example, a subwoofer, and we could say that our subwoofer has a low pass crossover applied at 100 hertz. In other words, everything below 100 hertz, it's going to play. Finally, our third category of crossovers is called a band pass crossover. What this is, is it's a combination of a low pass and a high pass crossover. So what this actually is, let's say we're doing like a four speaker system. We have a subwoofer, mid bass, mid range, and tweeter. So this is what the mid bass and mid range speakers would have because you're gonna go from a subwoofer, you're gonna hand off to the mid bass, 
that's going to then hand off to the mid-range and so on. And I should have said this is a better example of a tweeter, a high pass, because generally you're not going to have any sort of crossover on the top end of a tweeter. It's just going to be a high pass crossover at whatever frequency you determine. So we need to do some more classification because for each of these three types of crossovers, there's actually active crossovers and passive crossovers. A passive crossover basically means that the crossover has set values for the frequency and the slope and we cannot change them. This is an example of a passive crossover. Most of the time these are included with component speakers in order to limit the frequencies that are going to the mid-range speaker and to the tweeter. Now the advantage of a passive crossover is if you don't really know what you're doing, they're easy to use and they prevent you from potentially damaging your speakers. But the disadvantage is passive crossovers will actually eat up a little bit of the power that goes to your speaker. Another disadvantage of passive crossovers is most of the time they're designed to be used in a specific configuration. In other words, they might be designed so that the mid-range speaker and the tweeter are located right next to each other. But as you well know, our install might require that the mid-range is located down in the kick panel or down in the bottom of the door, and the tweeter is located up high in the sail panel. So it's nice to be able to control the crossover in those cases. This is where we need adjustability and an active crossover comes into play. So an active crossover is usually a device that goes in between the radio or source unit and the amplifier. Most all digital signal processors include the ability to control crossovers in an active manner. Additionally, most amplifiers now do give us the ability to also control the crossover point. With active and adjustable crossovers, we have the ability to actually control more of our tuning we don't lose any power, and most of the time we can also attenuate the signal between two different speakers so we can better level match tweeters to mid-range speakers to mid-bass to subwoofers and so on. So I know some of you guys out there are already thinking, well, now I definitely don't need a digital signal processor. I can control the crossover of my amplifier, right? But I wanna remind you that most digital signal processors also give you the ability to change a very important parameter called the slope. Let's take a look here again on the whiteboard and start to understand slope. In this example, we have a speaker that has a high pass crossover applied at 100 hertz. We have output mapped against frequency. I want you guys to understand something important about crossovers. Let's say that we're playing a range of different frequency notes and we're coming down. In other words, a sound like that. <laughs> that was a pretty sweet sound effect, I'm not gonna lie. What's important to understand is once we get to 100 hertz, just because there's a crossover there, that doesn't mean that at 99 hertz, we're not gonna hear that tone, or at 75 hertz, we're not gonna hear that tone. There's a roll off or a slope. The rate at which this attenuation occurs is the slope. So in layman's terms, basically how aggressive or how shallow the slope is. Six dB per octave is first order, 12 dB per octave is second order, 18 dB per octave is third order, and 24 dB per octave is fourth order. Now what do I mean per octave? An octave is half of your frequency or double of your frequency. So if we look at our 100 hertz example, one octave up would be double 100 hertz or 200 hertz. Same example, one octave down would be half of 100 or 50 hertz. So if you remember, I said that a fourth order crossover is 24 dB per octave, so what's actually happening here is you can see that we're down 24 dB per octave. So a quick little advanced side note, Linkwitz Riley style crossovers are always at negative six dB at the crossover point. Butterworth crossovers are negative three dB at the crossover point, but that's a little bit more advanced. It's not really critical to know for this particular video. What I wanna stress here is the slope. So just so that we can do a quick little comparison, if we were doing a second order crossover, in other words, 12 dB per octave, it would look something like this. So you can see in this case, 24 dB per octave is going to cut the frequency more rapidly than the 12 dB per octave. So why do we even need different slopes? After all, 
Wouldn't you think that a nice, slow, tame roll-off would be what we would want? While you might think this is advantageous, it's not always the case. We likely will want our speaker to play frequencies that are close to its lower limits, or close to its upper limits before they get to beaming. In these cases, if we roll off the frequency response slowly, we're likely going to either damage the speaker because we're actually going to hit those frequencies, or we're going to have beaming because we're going to be allowing frequencies to pass that are too high. Something else that we need to consider is when we hand off between two different speakers, the slopes that we pick for our crossover are going to have an effect on the final overall response between the two speakers. I don't want to go too deep into how crossovers can be combined in this video because I could honestly go on and on, but I do want to give you guys a quick example example to make a point. Let's say that we're handing off from a 12 inch subwoofer to a six and a half inch speaker. Let's say that we've selected a 100 hertz crossover for both of them and they're both 12 dB per octave or a second order crossover. When we actually go to sum the response and play our system, we're going to end up with a hump that looks like this. That red line is our total response, or is it? What actually happens in this case if both speakers are wired electrically in phase is you're going to actually have a dip. Now why would that be? You see, a change in the crossover also means a change in phase. So what actually happens in this example at the crossover point is one of the speakers will be 180 degrees out of phase from the other. So what this means is they'll actually be canceling each other out and you'll have a null. Now the way to correct this and actually get this top red line is to flip one of the speakers electrically out of phase. Then when it sums, it will be this bump like this, but still it's a bump. A simple solution here for when we're getting started is to use fourth order crossovers. I've drawn in fourth order crossovers again at 100 hertz, and what actually happens in this case is at the crossover point, one of the speakers is going to be 360 degrees out of phase, or in other words, a full circle, it's back in phase with the other speaker. So two fourth order crossovers will actually sum flat. We can go more into this kind of stuff in the future. So up until now, we've just been picking hypothetical values for our hypothetical speakers. Let's actually talk some real world numbers. Before we go on though, I do want to take a quick second to say thank you to my Patreon support team. You guys may have noticed I have this cool new whiteboard now. That's thanks to them. I constantly have things like this that I would like to get in order to make these videos a little bit better. So if you're interested in helping some of the future content, be sure to check that out at the end of the video. I could use your support. So let's actually pick some crossovers. Now in this example, I want to use a typical three-way system where you have a subwoofer, a speaker, and a tweeter. So let's take a look at a subwoofer. Get it. For each of the different speakers, I want to take a look at the high pass side and the low pass side. So for the subwoofer, I mentioned it a little bit earlier in the video, but for our high pass filter, it's actually going to be called a subsonic filter. Now the reason for this crossover is to actually prevent our subwoofer from playing too low and thus bottoming out, damaging the subwoofer. A general rule for this is we want to set that frequency at a half octave below the tuning frequency of a ported box. So what that means is let's say we have a ported subwoofer box and it's tuned to 30 hertz. One full octave down is 15 hertz. So the difference between 30 and 15 is 15 hertz. What we need to do is divide 15 by two. So 15 divided by two is seven and a half. So we want to go seven and a half hertz down from 30. In other words, 22 and a half hertz. That's where we would want to set our subsonic filter in order to prevent the speaker from bottoming out. Now for the low pass, in general, we're usually going to set that anywhere from 80 to 100, maybe even a little bit higher than 100, depending on what you've picked for your mid bass or whatever the next speaker is that you're handing off to. And I didn't really mention this before, but these are just rules of thumb. Of course, your particular system could absolutely change. I'm just giving you guidelines for something to start with. Next up is our mid range or mid bass speaker. For these kind of speakers, you wanna take a look at the instruction manual or the specs online, and you wanna find 
the free air resonance or the resonant frequency, it's often labeled as FS. In the case of this particular speaker, I don't know if you'll be able to see it here, but it's actually 55 Hertz. Now a general rule of thumb for a good starting point is two times that number. So two times FS. The reason we do this is very similar to the reason that we set the subsonic filter on the subwoofer. We don't want to play our speaker below the resonant frequency or we're going to risk damaging the speaker. Additionally, the closer you get to the resonant frequency, the more distortion there is. So we want to stay away from that number. That's why our general rule is to double it for this crossover point. So in this case, our FS was 55 Hertz. We're going to double it. So we want to set around 110 Hertz. Now that's exactly why I said before that you might want to be a little bit higher than 100 here, depending on your speaker. You don't necessarily want to have that gap. Technically you might be able to have that gap, but you're going to have to do some tuning. So it's better to just start with this. In this case, you would probably want to make it 110 Hertz. And now you know that this here is also going to be 110 Hertz. Now, where do we apply the low pass filter for this speaker? In other words, where do we stop it from letting it play any frequencies that are higher? Well, this is based off what I was talking about at the beginning of the video, again, beaming. Now, a lot of car audio manufacturers will have a recommendation for this value. And if you can get a hold of the data that shows the off axis response, you can even start to see where when you're 20 degrees, 30 degrees off axis, you can start to see where the response drops off and is no longer level. And that's typically a good point to have your low pass setting because you don't want to get any higher than that because your off axis performance starts to degrade. So as an example, in this case, that occurs around 3000 Hertz. So that is going to be our low pass setting. Also, just so you guys know, beaming is actually a function of the design of the cone but it's mainly based upon the actual diameter of the speaker. So finally, we have our tweeter. Now our tweeter is much like our mid-range slash mid-bass driver, where for our high pass setting, we're again going to go based off double FS. Now I wanna make something very clear here. A lot of times it's not a big deal for mid-bass, mid-range speakers if you go a little bit lower than what they should as long as you don't play them for a prolonged amount of time. But with a tweeter, like I said earlier, if you play low frequencies on a tweeter for even a second, you can blow that tweeter instantly. So really make sure you know what you're doing. Make sure before you're sending any crazy, insane, loud music to a tweeter that you're absolutely positive that the crossover is set correctly. Now for the low pass on the tweeter, typically doesn't even apply. Most tweeters, if not every single tweeter, can play up to, if not higher, than 20,000 hertz which as a quick reminder, 20 hertz is the low end of our hearing spectrum, 20,000 hertz is the high end. So again, no low pass crossover on the tweeter. I do wanna point out that it is good to research the frequency response on axis and off axis for different tweeters if you're able to, because then you can see how directional they are, and then you can have a good plan for your install on whether or not that tweeter should be pointing directly at you, or if you can get away with it being a few degrees off axis. And sometimes tweeters even excel being off axis rather than having them pointed directly at you. So that's just something to consider. So these general rules of thumb will give you a great starting point for the next time that you're gonna start tuning or setting up a system. But just remember that you need to do all the research yourself and check into the actual values for your particular speakers so that you don't risk damaging them. So I hope that this video helped you learn something new. If you have any questions or anything you wanna add, be sure to leave me a comment down below. If you're new here, I'd love to have you as a subscriber. I upload new videos every Monday and actually I'm trying to reach a goal where I'm uploading even more videos. For those of you that have been around for a while, that's part of the reason that I could use your support on Patreon. I won't go too crazy talking about it right now, but if you wanna learn a little bit more about it, you can check it out down below. Also, a special thanks to Rockford Fosgate for supplying the different speakers and subwoofers that I showed in this video. This is actually the gear that's for the Jeep build, so make sure that you stay tuned in for more details on that coming soon. Thank you guys again for watching. As always, a special thanks goes out to Eddie, Brian, Ali, Finchie, EJ, Emmanuel, Rory, Truman, and Jerry, along with the rest of the Patreon support team.
It is actually kind of expensive and does require a lot of time in order to make these videos and these guys help me out with these costs so that I can focus on creating new content. To learn more, check out Patreon down below. Thank you again for watching.